Okay, so uh, one recording is on. And uh, it's going to be recorded for the website as well. Okay, first of all, very good morning to you guys and, and thanks for uh, turning up faithfully. Uh, it's now the, I think it's the third, third presentation or fourth, fourth presentation, I think it, it is this one. Um, with one failed in between, so hopefully uh, it's going to go smoothly. Uh, I did check a little bit earlier, you know, with the website and everything, and it seems that uh, everything is fine, so everything is responsive and so on, so hopefully we're going to get through. Don't freak out when you, I don't know whether you can see the number of slides on the, um, um, on the presentation here. Most of the slides are just pictures, so uh, it, we should be done in about an hour. Okay, last week we were looking at uh, pumps, and it's obviously it's all about thermodynamics, and uh, we were looking at pumps uh, for moving liquids, yeah. ideally for um, for liquids which um, which move hold, uh, hot or cold water or, or oil or whatever it may be from one place of the plant to the other. Today we're going to look at uh, gases. Yeah. And again, some of the pumps are very similar uh, to the... Um, the uh, the pumps we use for pumping liquids, but uh, anyway, we're going to see it today. So it's a little bit different. A few more pumps, a few more concepts are introduced. The unit number, which you should um, uh, write down, is uh, 4.5 yeah, for your, your one file, or uh, I'm not, not quite sure whether Gary taught you to, to use it for one file. Okay, uh, let's make a start, and let's see. Ah, oh, yeah, down here. So I came well prepared. I've got a mouse this time, so I should all operate a bit better. Last last week my um, laptop was a little bit moody with the, the touchpad, so it didn't work too well. So um, eventually we may have it all smoothed out and it works really well. Who knows? Okay, that's what we, you will understand at the end of the lesson. You will understand fundamental differences between different uh, types of pumps used for moving gases. Yeah. So it's all about gases. We mentioned liquids as well during the presentation, but predominantly it's about moving gases. Um, and, and gases, when I talk gases, it includes air, it um, includes, um, you know, like um, gas you use for heating, like propane or butane, um, uh, things like that. But it's, it's essentially, it's not a, a liquid, it's a, it's a gas. Okay, uh, the next things, this is what we're going to look at. So uh, we're going to be looking at um, reciprocating piston types. So that's pretty much the same stuff be used for liquids as well, and you will remember this from, from last week, hopefully. And then we look at uh, rotary blowers, yeah? and for rotary blowers we've got two different types. One is called vein, or they are called vein blowers, and the other one are called uh, lobe blowers. Yeah? So, um, so they are the, the two different types of blowers. And again, this is exclusively for gases, so you can't put a liquid through those, um, you know, through those blowers. Uh, then we've got something which is called centrifugal blowers. Again, uh, last week we were looking at piston types uh, of pumps and also centrifugal pumps. Uh, and in the same way for gases, we have got centrifugal blowers as well. And then uh, within there, we've got radial flow fans and axial flow fans. So we're going we're gonna to be looking at them as well. And then right at the end, we're just going to mention it. We're just going to introduce it so you can see what it looks like. We've got multi-stage units. Now, these units or multi-stage pumps, they pretty much, um, you know, are made up of any of these systems here. So you've just got a lot of pumps in series to uh, improve the um, the pressure and um, the the pump ratio. Okay, um, right. Next one. Next slide. Um, gas pumps. Yeah, just a couple of pictures of gas pumps. Um, and and th the first thing you may notice is that um, they're not much different to to liquid pumps either. On the outside, they pretty much look um, the same way, but on the inside, um, they are slightly different. There are different demands on pumps um, pumping gases as opposed to pumps pumping liquids. Um, right. Now you can see this here. It's, I don't know how big it is on your screen, uh, but it's just giving you a little bit of an idea what they are. I mean, when you look at this pump here, I don't know whether you can see the red dot. I hope you can. Uh, you see that thing here is just a motor where the little red dot goes round. And then obviously the the pump itself is just that tiny little dinky thing here. And it, it doesn't need to be that big. You know. OK, 
Okay, so you've got a we've got another pump here as well. This looks like um, a centrifugal pump, you know, where the gases sort of spin spun round, and um, uh, then you normally have got like a ninety degree angle of some sort or another, and it blows it all out. Anyway, we're going to look in more detail in a minute. Okay, um, first question is: Describe when would you need to pump gas or air? Uh, can you just come up with uh, some answers here? Um, just type them in if you can. Uh, obviously, if you're on a phone, it's a bit more difficult. If you're on a computer, um, you can do that a lot easier. Okay, the question again. Um, when would you need to pump gas or air? So what are the scenarios? Like at work, do you have systems which pump gas or air? Come on, guys, get the keyboards going. Um, hydraulics, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously hydraulics is uh, predominantly liquids, but um, when you look at fluid power systems, it actually refers to both uh, gas and air. Yeah, so it, it includes pneumatics as well. Um, have you got like a, a concrete example where, and I'm sure you will have it. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Systems requiring steam. So steam essentially is a liquid that's been turned to gas, and um, you are pumping steam, yeah, uh, potentially, maybe to heat things up, or you, you want to use the power of steam to, to drive a generator, like in a power plant. So that's a good point. Um, can you give me some more points? Uh, who have we got? We've got Mustafa. Boilers, uh, yeah, yeah. Either to heat the gas up or... Okay, air condensing, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking of some, some nasty stuff my granddad did after the war. Um, he's dead now, so he can't be prosecuted. Um, to increase the pressure, good point, good point. So for condensing, you know, when we condense air, um, cooling things down, we can use um, the gas, a fridge itself, yeah. We, we've effectively, we are pumping a gas around. We looked at refrigeration units a few weeks ago. Um, Anyway, back to my granddad. What he used to do is, uh, after the war, money didn't buy an awful lot, so, um, and it was highly illegal at the time. So he had his own private distillery in the garden, and, and um, obviously there you would have condensing taking place as well. He didn't use a pump. It was just a, a temperature-driven. Uh, so the hot air or the condensed stuff uh, rose. Um, the alcohol sort of evaporated. Uh, he started condensing it. And then uh, he could produce his own schnapps. Now, um, the the thing is, or the tragedy at the time was, the money wouldn't buy you anything. But if you had cigarettes or alcohol, you could pretty much get anything you wanted. Um, and the house I used to grow up in, um, part of it was built on my granddad using a distillery for a couple of years, so having his own distillery in the garden and uh, evading the law. It could, we would have been in serious trouble if they caught him, but uh, they never did. So he was lucky. Okay, gas goes to the burners to cook the bread. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, thanks, Brad, Luke. Um, yeah, spot on. Yeah. So you, you've got um, gas which needs to be pushed around um, the plant and, and potentially it needs to be pumped as well to build up pressure to move the gas to where you want it to be. You know, and Very often gas, depending where it comes from, is pressurized. But if it isn't, then you have to, to build up pressure and you do this by using pumps. Yeah. Okay, any one more suggestion and then I'll move on. You mentioned one thing which, uh, let me just go through it, uh, through the text box. Yeah, there's one thing which you haven't mentioned and, and you will have it in your plant. Let's have a look. Mustafa and Hari, you said pneumatics, okay. Yeah, spot on. Um, what's the thing called that produces the pneumatics? And you've got a pump, a gas pump, right at the beginning of it. Air compressors, that's it. That's the one I was looking for. Thank you. But, but essentially, it's pneumatics. And uh, you came up. Uh, thanks, Brett and Luke, for, for the contribution. Uh, air compressors, yeah. Compressor and dryer. Yeah, dryers as well. Okay, yeah, spot on. Yeah, with dryers, you have to pump air, hot air, through them to, um, you know, to get stuff uh, dried up. 
And thinking about it, it's a good point. I never thought about that. But dryers, yeah, even domestic um, tumble dryer or something, you, you pump air. And I think mostly it's a centrifugal blower. Um, into the, uh, you heat it up and you pump it into, you know, in between the clothes. And um, sometimes you've got a condenser in there as well, so it turns it into water and you, you just pump it out. Okay, uh, let's move on. Thanks for, for the contribution uh, there. Okay, I've got a couple of things here. So we've got air compressor pumping domestic gas. Yeah. So the gas which goes into your, um, into your home is, um, you know, it's been pressurized somewhere uh, and it's not very high and they, they, they obviously they can't do it for domestic gas because they, they don't want like major explosions if there's a leak somewhere. Uh, gas pipelines as well, so they have to pressurize the gas to pump it through a pipeline. Uh, we've got air conditioning systems yeah, where uh, the air is blown out and it's blown over uh, a cool or cold surface. Climate control in general, whatever it is, so it might be a fan or it might be uh, like an aircon system. It might be the uh, car ventilation, you know, the little blower to, to blow out the heat from your, from your matrix um, inside your car. Uh, heating systems in general, so some of them they've got um, some, um, some systems where, where, where gases are moved from A to B or where it's just blown out, heated up gases are blown out into the, into the room. And we've got a wind tunnel as well. And then, like you said, pneumatic systems. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, we're going to look now at different types of um, pumps, uh, which we have. The first uh, example is a reciprocating piston type pump. And it's the same as what we looked at um, at liquids or pumping liquids, but in this instance, um, we are pumping gases instead. Okay, um, I had quite some interesting animations on the PowerPoint, and you could actually see the thing go around and the little valves opening up and shutting down. Um, but in order to, to use the software, I have to turn it to a PDF and um, the animations, they are pretty much killed off at that point. Um, let me just get the red ball and talk you through. Um, so that thing is just going to turn around. Yeah. So that's a red ball. And then the blue piston here is going to go forward and backward. Yeah. And so when it goes backward, it generates some suction. And then from down here, where the red ball is, uh, air sucked in. And, um, and then when the piston goes back, uh, up here the air is pumped out. Yeah. And because the piston sort of tries to compress the, the gas, uh, this will seal itself. It, it will, the compression will seal it, and the compression will you know, make sure that that one opens up. And then you know, when it sucks the gas in, obviously it's the other way around. So that one is sucked down and sealed, and that one is opened up. So that's a very basic pump, yeah. and it's the same concept and the same principle as you have for liquid uh, pumps as well. Okay, here's a question. Um, what would be the difference if I use the same type of pump for a liquid or for a gas? What has to be, what is different between those two pumps? There's one element which has to be different. Um, can you come up with an answer? What do you think is different between, you know, pumping liquids or gases? Spot on, yeah, seals, water seals, yeah. For liquid, you need water seals, so the seals possibly don't have to be quite as tight because um, the viscosity of a liquid is obviously it's a lot higher than a gas. Uh, when you've got a gas, um, the seals have to be dead tight, yeah, really, really tight, really, really well sealed up, uh, including the pump housing, the pistons, and everything else. Uh, in order to work, yeah. because you don't have any um, liquid, or for example, if you pump oil, you've got some self-lubrication or something like that, and you don't have all this stuff, yeah. So you have to have really, really good seals um, for gas pumps as opposed to, to liquid pumps. So liquid pumps, you get away with a, a sin or two. Um, with gas pumps, you don't, yeah. It needs to be spot on. There's any, any leak somewhere, and the whole system just falls down. Okay, uh, next one. It goes really fast today with uh, switching the slides over. I'm, I'm well pleased. Okay, recipro reciprocating pi piston type pump. And um, we've got just another graphic. And this is actually an animation if it were running. Uh, pity uh, that it doesn't run. But anyway, here we go. Uh, we've got 
Again, you can see this here, and you've got all the descriptions as well. So the, the piston goes back, we've got the suction, so all the gases are sucked in, and then the piston goes back the other way, so it, it compresses the gas, and then uh, that is sealed tight, and that one is opened up, the valve, and you get a discharge. Yeah. And so you can suck things in, and you can pump them out, and um, you know, based on the speed of the, the piston, you can increase the pressure. Yeah. So you can control a little bit the pressure as well. Uh, same concept as before, it's just a different, um, a different uh, diagram and slightly different setup. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, so we've got a, it's just a picture of, um, this is a Myers E5430. Uh, I, I haven't seen it myself in real life, I just picked it up from the internet, but I've seen similar ones in real life, and, and that is just a, a, a pump used for, um, for gases, and it's got uh, a high pressure uh, outlet, yeah, so it can generate quite a bit of pressure. To me, I'm not quite sure, I, I sh would have to read through the, um, through the documentation, it looks to me like it's a multi-stage pump, yeah. so you've got like several stage stages. And with that, you can uh, produce a huge amount of pressure. So that would be ideal if you have, like, uh, you know, little pipelines going throughout the factory or something. And there's quite some distance to cover. So you would have uh, something like this. Okay. It's just to let you have a look. So this is a, a reciprocating piston pump. That's the principle of this pump. That's what it's used for. Okay. Uh, next one. Okay, uh, I'm not sure whether you've seen these pumps. Um, this one is called uh, a pump jack, and um, it's an overground drive for a reciprocating piston pump in an oil, oil well. Um, I had the privilege of seeing them, so my uh, colorful work life, I, I once worked for, for how long? Only a two-week period in New Mexico, in, in, in America, and it's, it's just a desert. Yeah, um, uh, the place where I was working is, uh, you probably know it if you, um, if you're into this sort of thing, it was Roswell. And uh, quite an interesting town, uh, all a bit crunky and crazy, but, um, um, but I had to drive, I was doing an elect electronics job, and I had to, to get some bits, I had to drive to the next town, which was called Hobbs. And it was about, um, I don't know, about 100 miles away, something like that, ridiculously long distances, but... It took me about sort of two hours to get there, and, and sometimes you just needed some components, couldn't get them in town, so I had to go to the next town. There was a dealer there. And, um, and, and whilst I was driving through the desert, it's, it's just like a, literally like a desert. There's nothing gross there. It's dry, arid, uh, but you see these, these oil pumps all over the place. Yeah? Never seen as many as that. So it's like a farmer. He stuck, put himself a little oil pump up. There was a big tank somewhere, and they were just filling them up and selling the oil. And that thing was just going day and night, just pumping oil all day long. Uh, quite interesting. So there were thousands of them just uh, splattered all over the, uh, the desert over there. Uh, anyway, the, the concept is pretty much the same thing. So it's just, it's got suction, it, it sucks the oil up and, um, um, and then uh, tries to squeeze it out and um, put it into a tank. So um, well, uh, again, you can do it with gases as well. And this is the point I wanted to make. You can do it actually as a water well as well. Let me see. I think I've got another picture. Uh, yeah, we've got the piston versus plunger pump. So we've got a piston, and here we've got a plunger. Pretty much the same concept. Um, the piston is capable of producing more pressure. A plunger not so because of the smaller surface, you know, for an equivalent size pump. And uh, I think there... Ah, yeah. This is sort of the old pumps you may have seen and uh, the whole idea is it goes down to the water level and uh, and you've got like this little um, lever here on the side and you pump water now we're talking about gas and and we're going to come to this um, even though meant for water they will need to pump air at times when do they these pumps need to pump air so these were typical pumps in victorian days you would have them all over london yeah and uh, when people needed water, they didn't have tap water in the uh, in the house, so they would go go on the street and um, pump water from a well. Um, okay, sorry, Brett, I didn't didn't see this. Uh, let me go back. Which slide were you referring to? The uh, this one, Brett, Luke. 
Okay. The piston pump is more efficient than the plunger pump. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a different name for pretty much the same concept. But again, the reason is uh, you've got a bigger surface area right on here and a better seal as well, uh, especially for gases. Yeah, for gases, it's more efficient. Okay. Uh, going back to the, the water ones, um, when do they need to, to pump air? Uh, any ideas? Have to wait a little bit. I know there's a bit of a delay. Um, to prime them, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, you're talking about priming. Yeah, some pumps they need priming for for water, um, but these pumps um, they they can pump air, and it's to do with the atmospheric pressure. And you can um, you can create a suction to have water uh, coming up a pump up to about 10 meters. If you have got 11 meters, it doesn't work anymore. It'll go up to uh, to 10 meters. Okay, uh, Brad, um, what was that again? Priming. Priming is when you put some water in to, or some liquid in to, to keep the pump going. And we were looking at this last week. Um, there are certain pumps which need, require priming. And uh, um, if you don't prime them, then it just wouldn't work. So you would have, um, what are the pumps called again? Um, the centrifugal pumps. They need priming to start them off. Yeah. Um, the piston pumps they can get away without because of the uh, the valve setup, so they can suck in some air and they can suck in some some liquid as well. For these water pumps, um, you could you could sink a, a well up to about 10 meters below ground, and they would still work. Uh, any further lower, and they wouldn't work anymore. It's to do too with the the air pressure. Any more questions? Are you okay with this? Or I'm just waiting for a moment for the. Um Okay, good. Uh, c carry on. Right, um, just a little bit of text here for the reciprocating piston type pump. Uh, the same concept as a displacement pump. That's the one which we looked at when we when we looked at liquids. It works as a positive displacement pump. So you displace um, something, yeah, and then uh, you um, um, you know you suck in your liquid or your gas. Um, it can be used for liquids and gases. Can be used over a wide range of pressures as well. Ideal when there is a need for high and consistent pressure. So that's the, the key for these types of pumps. There should be a high and consistent pressure. Yeah. The, if, if you need this, it's ideal. Yeah. And for example, pipelines um, and things like that, they need a high pressure to pump the gut through, and it needs to be consistent as well. Okay. Uh, next one. Um, we're now looking at, at sort of the rotary blow-up pumps, the concept, and you can, uh, I just looked for some pictures, and you can see these pumps here. Um, you can find them all over. Uh, the most interesting one I've seen is on, on top of a metro, and um, they, um, obviously, the air gets quite stale if a metro is underground, and, and they had these systems to just pump out, um, you know, the stale air, and to cause a little bit of an airflow in, in the metro system. Uh, I mean, these are obviously, they are not at a metro, they're at some factory somewhere, but uh, they are blower pumps. Okay, let's have a look more how they look like. I uh, can see them here, that's what they look like, you know, in the casing and everything. So you've got your little shaft here, you drive the thing, and then, um, you know, goes in there, comes out the other side. You can see this here. You've got one side the inlet, on the other side the outlet. Um, okay, a little bit about the technology. Uh, just a few more examples. So we've got blower pump pumps here. So one is for ionizing air to, to, to blow them. They've got another name as well. They also sometimes refer to as axial blowers. And then here we've got a gas blower. Yeah, so this might be at a, a petrochemical plant uh, or you know gas works or something. They might have this um, th a pump of, of this type. Okay, now the big question is what do they look like on the inside? And um, here we go. So these are the the concepts. So that one, again, is this weird name, vein type blower pump. Um, these things here, you see those rods here, where the red dot is. Yeah, I'm just going to go up with the red dot yeah, and go down. Yeah, and then go to the left and right. Now, those things here, they are springs. And these rods are sort of spring-loaded, and they can push in and out. And so what they do is they... Um, they 
follow the uh, the round body of the pump and they sort of trap air as they turn round and then you can see as they, they move towards the outlet the air gets a bit more compressed and then as it moves around the uh, the air gets out this way so it comes in that way then it's sort of moved around by this uh, by this vein yeah, which is sort of spring loaded and tries to make an airtight seal it sort of moves around all the way here and then it comes out on, on the other side. Yeah. Um, the concept reminds me a little bit of, um, of bellows. You remember sort of in the old medieval days when the, I should have put a picture of that one in, when the blacksmith had some bellows and uh, he was just sort of pressing air together and yet your input and the output. So I thought maybe slightly similar to that. Um, okay, anyway, that's a vein type blower pump. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you look from a maintenance perspective, you can pretty much figure out what's the first thing that's going to go. And uh, my thinking is you've got some friction at these points here. Um, so at the end of the vein. So they need to seal it off somehow, otherwise it just doesn't work. And, uh, and so they're going to go. So I'm not quite sure you know, what is done in, sort of in, the, in pumps, how they make sure that these veins last as long as possible. And then the next one is those springs here, they will eventually go as well. Uh, and obviously you've got the usual stuff, your bearings and, and everything else. But, um, but you can see that, that there's uh, certainly there's a maintenance issue with these things as well. And so eventually uh, they're going to go. But normally when you buy these pumps, they, um, they give you a runtime. And so they know how long, roughly how long they're going to last, how many hours. Okay, the next one, that's an interesting one. And it's called a rotary lobe type blower and just have a look at these ones here so you have got these rotary blocks and uh, and they just turn round and as they turn round they suck in the air they trap it and they squeeze it out yeah so the air comes in here and goes out at the top if you follow the red dot here yeah. and again they um, um, look very interesting but uh, they work and they're they're good for gases yeah. um, from a maintenance aspect, uh, you can obviously you can see straight away uh, there's going to be wear and tear involved uh, because these need to press together these two uh, lobes, and uh, eventually uh, they're not going to work as well, and there are going to be little gaps in there, and the, the performance of the pump goes down. So again, vein type before, and these are lobe type blowers. On the outside, they can pretty much look the same. Uh, on the inside, obviously, they're very different. And, and very different problems with them as well. Okay, we've got some low blowers here. You can see them what they look like for real. So you can see those metal things which sort of fix together. Um, they must be so precisely engineered to try and make this work. I mean, a couple of millimeters out and it just wouldn't work anymore. You, the, that thing would destroy itself. You can see it here as well. So you've got these lobes going round. Yeah. And um, that's, again, it's a typical a low blower pump here and you've got another one there and you can look at the the inside here as well and you can see the lobes here you know, on the rotor so um, gives you a rough idea but um, also sort of important to understand that there are very different technologies which are in use and I think I've got a table here so certain pumps are better than than others and you use certain pumps for certain certain things okay let's move over to um, the um, other funds which we have got, we've got an, and that's mostly sort of used within, um, you know, cooling and uh, climate control and things like that. So we've got an axial flow fund, and um, I've got some text in a minute, but but these have been around since the 1800s. You know? So they've been around for a long, long time. So they they suck in the air on this end. So just a box standard propeller. You've got a little bit of a motor here, and you get an airflow out, and you can see as well it sort of compresses the air a little bit. And you get like a nice stream of uh, compressed air blowing out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> got a bit of text here. Just going to go through it. Uh, axial fans date back to the um, horizontally configured windmills of Europe and the Middle Ages. The first electrically powered fans were introduced in the 1880s, and they were axial fans. Axial fans are named for the direction of the airflow they create 
uh, blades rotating around an axis draw air in parallel to that axis and force air out in the same direction. Uh, axial fans can create airflow with a high flow rate, meaning they create a large volume of airflow. However, the airflows they create are of low pressure. Uh, they require a low power input for operation. So again, you get a lot of air flowing through, but the, the key is you can't pressurize air or gases very well using this method. So you're better off using um, you know, the, the, the gas pumps we were discussing before, the um, reciprocating piston using, um, or the, the blower funds using either lobe or vein type um, to create pressure. Okay. Uh, and you can see as well, this is an axial airflow fund, and, and if you ever open up your computer, uh, you probably see one or two of these funds in there. And on top of your CPU and uh, maybe elsewhere, maybe on, on the edge of the casing to blow the air out. And that's basically all they are predominantly used for, it's just cooling. I've got another one here, axial airflow, um, low pressure, high volume, used for cooling. They are energy efficient, yeah, so you don't need a lot of energy to run them. They are very low cost, available for DC and AC applications, and there's no change in the direction of airflow. If you ever use um, uh, these axial flow fans for uh, cooling components, um, I'm just mentioning this, you know, sharing a bit of experience. The best brand, supposedly, is called Pabst. Yeah. Can I write this on here? Um, I'm not sure how to do this. Let me, let me just try it out on this presentation. So text. Mm, yeah, that's how it's written. Pabst funds. I think you can see it. Um, yeah, so, hey, it works. Uh, first time. So they're called Pabst uh, funds, and um, they're really, really good. They, um, they pride themselves in low friction, very good engineering, and supposedly they last a long time. I've had a bunch of them and um, sort of bought them secondhand uh, from a, uh, a big company that was having sort of liquidation uh, stuff. And, and I found that they are good. They just run that much more smoothly than the other ones. A bit more expensive if you buy them from new, but they probably last about 10 times as long. Just keep it in the back of your mind if you ever need to, to look for some cooling fans. Um, it's a company which prides itself in, you know, high quality and having the best and so on. Uh, next one. Um, just let you look at this diagram a little bit. Uh, it's a car radiator system. And um, yeah, you can see, uh, just to explain a little bit, so... <clears throat> Uh, obviously, we need cold water to cool the engine down, otherwise the oil gets too hot and uh, then the oil film breaks and the engine ceases. So we need a good, effect, efficient cooling in, in our cars. That thing at the, back's, at the back is a little radiator, which is in the, in the inside of your car, and you blow some air through them and uh, make sure that you are nice, warm and comfy in winter time. Um, and then, uh, obviously, we've got our radiator at the front of the car, and what happens is, if you are stood and there's no wind going through the radiator, the, uh, the uh, engine is going to heat up, and the, uh, the water in, in the radiator is going to get too hot, and then um, you've got a little thermostat, and when it gets too hot, you've got a, a fan blowing air through the radiator to allow, uh, to get, you know, to enable um, the hot air to be removed from the radiator and cold air pumped through it to to cool down the, uh, the engine and cool down the, the water, the coolant for the engine, making sure it goes further down. So it's just like another um, way to do this. Now, if this fan doesn't work, and it's, it's happened to me a few times before, uh, your engine is going to boil. So if it, if it gets to the alert, what you must do is, like when you're in a traffic jam or whatever, turn off the engine straight away. Yeah, don't keep it running. So if your car is normally, if it's stood, and the fan doesn't kick in, uh, you, need to, uh, you need to turn off the engine once the, uh, the warning light, the overheating light comes on. Comes on. If you don't do it, you'll, you'll destroy your engine. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, an axial flow fan that's just stuck in front of the, the radiator, and it's, it's on, most, on most cars. It's thermostatically controlled. Um, you know, somewhere near the radiator is a little thermostat. If it gets too hot, 
that thing is going to jump in and, um, and make sure that your, your cars cool down. How, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we've got about 20 minutes left. Okay. Um, um, you may recognize these from your bathroom. And the big problem in your bathrooms is condensation and moisture and stuff like that. And um, so you've got like extraction fans. Um, every hotel room, if you've ever been sort of in a, in a Premier Inn or something, uh, to make sure that it sort of doesn't get stale in there, they've got these extraction fans in there. They tend to connect them with the, with the lights, so when you go to the bathroom, the lights turn on, the fan comes on as well. And it's got a bit of a timer switch, so it runs a little bit uh, after you've done in the bathroom to make sure that all the damp and moist air is sucked out, and, um, uh, you know, put somewhere else. So these are axial flow fans. Yeah. And you don't, again, you don't need a lot of pressure. Um, you've got big hoses normally, and they are connected to somewhere on the outside. And all you need to do is just move some air out from, um, you know, for example, your bathroom or if it's your, uh, your cooker in the kitchen or something. Move some air away from there and uh, move it outside. Okay. Uh, the next one is radial blowers, and you find a lot of them in industry. Um, I just found one in our fake plant here at um, at the PMC, or simulated. It's not a simulated plant, isn't it? It's a real plant, uh, but uh, we, we don't do any production. That's the only thing. Yeah, um, but we could do if we wanted to. I think. Um, Anyway, I've, I've just found one there. So one of these old blowers was, was given to us. And uh, uh, again, it's used to move a lot of air in a very short time. Now, these are radial blowers. And, and you can see straight away the, the way they operate is centrifugal. So these, they suck the air in through the side. And then the air comes up here uh, through, this, through this channel here. And it's blown out of the, the building. So... Uh, yeah, that's a centrifugal blower. Uh, I've seen them within agriculture uh, where, um, you know, if they've got grain or something, they, um, they use these exactly the same blowers as well. So they could, you know, blow air or they could just, you know, pump some grain in and, um, you know, suck it with the air, together with the air, and um, put it sort of into, into corn stores or, or something or grain stores. So um, that's where, where I've seen them. It's very interesting. It works. It's a very dusty, dusty business, but it does work. Okay. Question, have you seen them at your work, these type of blowers? Question to you? <laughs> uh, yes, you have. Okay, what do you use them for? Okay, in interesting, same thing. Uh, coffee beans are hot air. So you use them for solids as well as for, um, for, ho for hot air. Uh, obviously, liquids will be a big problem because it's just the way they are made. Okay, that's, that's an interesting point. Getting rid of dust. Um, thanks, Joe, for that. Um, that's interesting. Um, and, and it works, yeah? So if you've got a dusty environment, you turn these things on and uh, all the air is just blown out. And, and so you, you can use them for, I'm not sure whether it's climate control or dust control or whatever you call it, but you can use them for that. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is a really nice animation, and um, I was so looking forward to run this animation, but obviously it didn't. It's a PDF, not a PowerPoint. Um, but anyway, you can see this as well. So just imagine, let your imagination go wild. Um, air moves in there, and then, you know, through a centrifugal force is piped out on the other side. There's one rule that the, um, the direction of airflow is changed by about 90 degrees, so in there, out there. Yeah. So you've got like a 90 degree change. Uh, right, next one. Okay, a little bit of text here. I'm just going to read it through to you. So we've got the centrifugal fans, and um, again you can see the little example here. It looks it's just a tiny one, but it looks pretty much the same as uh, the big ones, and it's the same concept. Um, the centrifugal fan was invented in 1832 by military engineer Lieutenant um, General Alexander Zablukov of the Russian Empire's Imperial Russian Army. Often called blowers, centrifugal fans vary differently from axial fans, 
the pressure of an incoming airstream is increased by a fan wheel, uh, a series of blades mounted on a circular hub. Centrifugal fans move air radially. The direction of the outward flowing air is changed usually by 90 degrees from the direction of the incoming air. The airflow created by centrifugal fans is directed through a system of ducts and or tubes. The saps create a higher pressure airflow than axial fans. Dis despite a lower flow rate, centrifugal fans create a, a steadier flow of air than axial fans. Centrifugal fans also require a higher power input. Okay, so with some advantages, some disadvantages, if you sort of sum summing it up, you get um, um, a more even pressure uh, which you can generate with these fans, uh, but they're not energy efficient, so they need a lot more power. Um, the airflow rate is lower, but you can increase or you can build up a lot more pressure. So that is one of the, the great advantages. Um, right. Uh, again, we've got centrifugal blowers. Um, you can see them here. It's just another couple of pictures, sort of how they work and, and how they're put together. Um, okay, we looked at this, yeah. So centrifugal fan, mechanical device for moving air and other gases. Other terms are blower. Interesting as well, so um, uh, sometimes they're called squirrel cage fan, apparently. Uh, I just read up on this and I thought I'd stick it in here. I've never, for me, a squirrel cage is used for three-phase motors. Uh, I've never heard it in the context of, uh, of blowers, but who knows? It might be an American thing or something. Uh, these fans increase the speed and volume of an airstream with the rotating impellers. Uh, centrifugal fans use the kinetic energy of the impellers to increase the volume of the airstream. And uh, centrifugal fans displace air radially, changing the direction by 90 degrees. Um, okay, we've got this sentence here. Centrifugal fans are constant displacement devices or constant volume devices, meaning that at a constant fan speed, a centrifugal fan moves a relatively constant volume of air rather than a constant mass. Uh, centrifugal fans are not positive displacement devices. Yeah. So again, we are just sucking stuff in and pumping it out. Uh, so it's not about displacement, but it's just about moving um, air at a constant speed. A okay. uh, couple of uh, advantages, disadvantages. Um, they're supposed to be more efficient in moving air. Um, they're sturdy, quiet, reliable, capable of operating over a wide range of conditions, but have higher capital costs. I'm not sure about the quiet bit. Uh, I'm sure when you've heard them, they, uh, they can get quite noisy. Um, I don't know. It's just what I picked up. Right. And here is a question to you. I let you um, study this diagram for a moment whilst I have a sip at my cup of coffee. You tell me what it is. Try and, f try and come up with what it is. It, it should be interesting. I just came across this diagram. Uh, yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, uh, from Tutbury, we got the answer. It's an automotive turbocharger. It's a turbocharger. Yeah, turbo for your car. Again, the whole idea is you get some um, some air. You compress the air, which goes into into the piston, and with that you can deal with a with a higher volume of fuel and air. You get a bigger mixture, and um, and you get more power out of your engine. And so at high speeds, you can squeeze a few more horsepower out of your engine. So that's, that's the idea of a turbocharger. Yeah. Compress air, move it in there, and then uh, you get this. OK, when you look at the compressor, can you tell me what is it? Is it a displacement? What type of um, charger is it? What type of gas pump is it? Can you tell me by now? Big difference is displacement or centrifugal. Which one is it? Mustafa Hari, you want to give it a go? Uh, is it centrifugal or is it displacement? Okay, no idea whatsoever. Uh, Joe? 
Joe Corey, any ideas? Brett Luke, okay, uh, Tukbury. Okay, yeah, yeah, got it. Centrifugal, yeah, it's centrifugal. So it's just like, pretty much like uh, um, your blowers, but um, uh, the air comes in and uh, you, s you um, have just like a propeller, you suck it in more and in that way you generate a pressure um, and uh, compress the air in that way and then um, you've got a bigger air intake into the, into the piston. Um, quite interesting. Interesting stuff. Okay, let's um, move on. Um, so this one is a multi-stage pump here. And, uh, and again, you can see how the pump works. I'm not quite sure. I, I was picking it up as a gas pump. Um, but you can see these little wheels as they go around. So I'm not sure whether that actually is a gas pump or it's used for liquids. Maybe it works on both. No idea. But just to give you an idea, so you've got uh, whatever pump you use, you've got several of them uh, connected to a shaft. And, um, and normally they, they are used to, to be able to generate more pressure yeah, and a better, better throughput. And, um, and that will be the purpose of a multi-stage pump. Okay, um, and I think we are almost done. I've just got a couple of scenarios. I, I can see another multi-stage pump here. So this certainly is for gas. Yeah, and um, th this looks to me like a displacement pump. So you've got like lots of little chambers where you get this displacement taking place. And, and with, with each stage, the, the pressure increases. And so you can produce a fairly high pressure. Um, okay, that's what it looks like in, in real life. So again, that thing at the back is the, the motor. So that turns the shaft around and, and bearing in mind you're generating a lot of pressure. So, um, so you, you possibly need a lot of power to turn that thing around. And then that thing here where you see the red dot, uh, that thing here is, is a, the actual multi-stage pump yeah. where it's all happening. Okay. Um, Summary of gas pumps. Um, it's probably, you know, the only slide I really need for this presentation is, um, you know, just looking at them. Some of them are self-explanatory, uh, centrifugal. I mean, the whole, uh, you know, lobe and vein type pumps. Uh, I mean, let me just get the red dot. Uh, that's the lobe one and the, the vein type one. It's maybe important to know how they operate. So when you do your maintenance, and you're looking at sort of plant preventative maintenance, you can make an assessment of, you know, when these pumps are likely to go down because, you know, they're gonna, there's going to be some wear and tear. Um, so it may be in, important to sort of understand how they work to, to be able to, to do something with them or to replace them in time before they actually break down if it's uh, crucial systems. Um, there are a couple of other ones as well which you didn't talk about. It's uh, the Le Solme screw which is similar to the lobe type. Uh, then we've got the three, uh, or roots three lobe. Um, you've seen in one of the previous slides, one of uh, an example where we got these three lobes, you know, a real pump, a picture of a real pump. And then we've got a really interesting one here, and that is uh, the Wankel rotary pump. Um, there's something like a Wankel engine, and, um, and they are very, very thirsty, but they can produce a huge amount of power and they, they tried to use them for racing cars. They, they did all this stuff with the Wankel engine in, um, um, I think it was in the, uh, the 70s. And one of the problems they had is, is that the, the seals were just going all the time because they were so efficient that they generated a huge amount of heat and that burned out the seals. And, and I thought that was the end of it. You would never hear of it. But uh, I was watching Top Gear some, some time ago. And apparently there are still some cars around with the Wankel engine. Uh, and again, um, maybe maybe that's a homework yeah, from your lecturer. Uh, YouTube um, Top Gear and Wankel Engine, and you probably get the uh, oh no, I think it was Wheeler Dealers. Wheeler Dealers. I don't know whether you know this program. It used to be on Sky or something. Wheeler Dealers. That's that was the one. And he got a Wankel Engine, uh, and I didn't know that they were still manufacturing them. It was quite interesting to to see what they were doing to try to get the thing going and and the comments I made about this. Um, and so you get Wankel pumps as well. Uh, the same concept, yeah. So it's just like this um, Stelz fighter lookalike triangle, which rotates around and uh, just pushes around and you've got like a, a couple of spark plugs in the Wankel engine and it keeps that thing spinning around at a phenomenal rate. So it's a high ref engine 
uh, with quite a lot of power, um, but quite thirsty as well, from what I understand. Okay, anyway, that's your homework, if you want to do it. You don't have to, but uh, uh, have a look at the Wankel engine. Wheeler dealers on YouTube and um, type in Wankel engine, and maybe uh, you'll find something. It was a really interesting program. Anyway, that's uh, also used for pumps as well. Right. Um, scenario. Uh, how much time have we got left? We've got about eight minutes left. I'm just going to mention these scenarios to you. I leave this to you. You know, just make you think a little bit about this, and then uh, uh, maybe you can come up with it now. Let, let's go through it. We've got a few minutes left. Uh, propane gas is heavier than air, and therefore tends to be near the ground. Okay, it's a problem. So propane is like the camping gas, uh, the stuff which is bottled up. If you get a leak in propane gas, um, it'll it'll actually go down, and um, and it'll settle down, you know, at the bottom of the the floor. And this is a big problem as well. I think town gas is similar. Um, this is a big problem if you if you've got a gas leak that it, it doesn't sort of you know you open the window and it goes away, but it actually settles near the near the floor. Uh, here's a scenario: we've got a petrochemical plant. Uh, propane is a byproduct of the refining process. And sometimes they capture it and they, you know, turn it into camping gas or LPG or uh, or something like that. Uh, but sometimes they they just want to get rid of it because uh, it's an unwanted, um, you know, unwanted product. So uh, propane needs to be burned off if it's unwanted. To burn off the gases, it needs to be pumped away from the main plant for safety reasons, which makes sense. And uh, the question is, what type of pump would you recommend and why? Okay. Um, by the way, the pictures are from Immingham. That's near um, on the other side of Hull, near Grims Grimsby, and it's one of the biggest refineries in the country. Or, I'm not sure whether it is the biggest, but it's the only few refineries left. So they, you know, the petrol you burn up in your cars. If you're up here in the north, it most likely comes from from this refinery here. And um, you can see all the, uh, the storage containers for the crude oil and. And then they refine it, and and they at night. I mean, when I'm, um, I've got a caravan near there, and at night you can see the uh, them burning off propane, you know, or gas, which is sort of a, a waste product from the refining refining process. Okay, what pump would you use to get rid of propane? Pump it away. And why? So, Corey, Joe, Mustafa, Harry, Riz, Jose, guys from Tutbury, what do you think? Have I missed somebody? Let me just go. Brett and Luke, I've missed Brett and Luke. Yeah. Come on, um, come up with a pump. <laughs> How many people are in Tutbury listening? Can you put the names down as well, which unfortunately for the register. Um. Sam, Luke and Josh, okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, okay. What engine? What type of engine? Uh, pump, not engine. What type of pump would, would you use from the ones we've had before? Obviously, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate. I can't... Um, I can, can I? Can't I? Okay, uh, you make a good point here. It has to be a high-pressure pump. Which pump provides a pretty high pressure? Uh, let me just go back. Ah, yes. I've got all the pumps here, haven't I? So I can just look at this one. What pump would you go for? Okay, reciprocating piston. Have you got one here? Um, actually, it's not, not here, is it? We've just got the, the low pumps and the vein pumps, but no reciprocating piston. Let's, let's quickly go back to that one. Um, and it works really well today. You know, last week it was, you know, you click the button, it took ages to go somewhere. Uh, a lot of slides. 
Uh, what? Yeah, it's got a good good image of the, the piston. Okay, we've got it here. Makes sense, okay? So, um, and, and this is one of the advantages it has. You can generate a high pressure and um, and you could use it through, you know, through um, this piston pump. No problem. It would work. Yeah, I totally agree with that. But what is another big problem when you when you're dealing with propane and when you're looking at the petrochemical industry? What is one thing they they're going to be all paranoid about? Yeah. Okay. It's just moving propane. That's right. Uh, what is the big Explosion, fire explosion, yeah, that's right. So you must avoid sparks at any cost. Yeah. So, um, and again, you could have a, a reciprocating piston pump and you could make it out of all sorts of materials which, um, which don't, I'm not sure what they use actually, but uh, you, you can make it out of materials which will not generate any sparks, plastics, ceramics, and things like that. Uh, what other pump could you use though? Uh, okay. Centrifugal, let's have a look. Um, it's going to be right at the end, isn't it? Really quick now. And it works. It works really fast. Okay. Yeah, centrifugal. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. If it's of metal, it's a big no-no because there's a potential of sparks. Um, you come up with the rotary blower. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure they might. Uh, let's have a look at the, the last one, the last slide where we've got all the pumps other than the uh, displacement pump, the piston pump. Which one do you think would work really well from, from the ones you've got here? And again, you can generate fairly good pressure as well. Problem with centrifugal is you, you get the pressure, you get quite a bit of stuff getting through, uh, but it's hard to maintain a high pressure. Uh, the low ones, yeah, yeah. This is the centrifugal. When you look at this one here, you get air through, um, and it's just a centrifugal force that is chucking the air to the other side. Um, but um, but it's, if you've got some resistance with pressure, it's, it's gonna be hard to push the air forward. Yeah. So it's not very good at generating pressure. Low pressure, no problem. High pressure is, is, can be difficult if you've got some resistance on the other side. Uh, the low pumps, yeah, they're ideal. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. They can deal with any pressure, providing you've got enough torque on your, on your engine uh, and uh, you know the, the motor that's driving them. Yeah. Okay, well done, guys, well done. Um, to be fair, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I wish I knew somebody who was working at um, the petrochemical plants uh, to get some insight of what they do there and um, and how they move these stuff. Uh, I'm thinking at Hovis, um, you will have gas for burners as well, and I would I would love to find out whether you've got pumps to move the gas around the... Uh, and maybe it could be a little bit of, you know, informal homework. Just ask um, your guys, your engineers, you know, what type of pumps you're using to move the gas about to the burners. And... Um, and you know whether you've got any problems and stuff like that. I would I would really love to to learn about them a little bit more in the real life. Anti gravity pump wind tunnel. What would you use for that? I don't know whether you've ever seen them. They're these um, pipes, yeah. and uh, you blow huge amounts of air into these pipes, and um, and you can sort of fly. Yeah. Okay, right, Brett, look, we use air to draw gas around the system, pressurized air. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how to how you pressurize it? How you pressurize the air so just from the compressor to um to pump it around? Okay, okay. It would be it would be great if you could um, maybe find out for next week. Um, is it next week? Yeah, next week we are still still on. Then we've got um, uh, what's it called half term, so there won't be a session. But uh, next week we'll we'll be here. Um, okay, so um, 
you could find out, it would be great. Yeah, it would be very great for it. Anti-gravity wind tunnel, if you ever get a chance to, I've never been in one of them, but I think I'm too fat for them anyway, so, so there wouldn't be much movement for me uh, sort of flying up there. Um, but um, but what, what sort of, do you know what they use to, to do that? What, what do they use to get this wind channel going? You can see in the picture, so this guy is just floating there, and he's, he's just floating on a cushion of air. And they're blowing the air at about, I think it's um, 100 to 200 kilometers. Um, yeah, Axel Flaufan, spot on, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Uh, they're just moving sort of tons of air at high speed in this, in this wind tunnel, and um, people just um, uh, can, can float on the uh, amount of air. Um, would be quite interesting. Uh, if I had an opportunity, I knew where to find one. I, I might try to see whether it would actually lift me off the ground, but uh, we'll see. Okay, that's pretty much all. Uh, we are sort of a couple of minutes over. Implications, compare gas pumps to liquid pumps. Uh, we're not going to do this. I'm going to um, sort of close it down here. What are the main issues with uh, pumping gases? Um, okay, one of them you already mentioned. One of them is... Um, the seals need to be really, really tight, and it's just to repeat what we mentioned already. And the other one is, is possibly fire, explosion, and, um, and so on. So they are the, the big issues with gases. And then when you have centrifugal funds, if you've got some air resistance on the other side, um, it's a lot harder to pump air into, into this. If you've got displacements or lobe or vein type pumps, um, depending if you've got a, a motor that's strong enough, you can increase the pressure quite quite a lot to try and force gases into into a system okay and i think we've done i've got a summary slide right at the end uh, we've looked at different pumps for moving gases so we looked at reciprocating piston pump rotary vein type pumps uh, rotary lobe type pumps centrifugal blowers axial radial blowers and the multi-stage pump um, and that's all. So thank you very much, guys, for, for staying with me for the hour, for turning up. Um, hope it wasn't too boring. Uh, next week, I'm not sure. We, we need to sort of cover a couple of things on the, um, on the, on the units, and then it's going to be exam preparation. So I want to try and get you ready for the exam. Um, this presentation is going to be on YouTube, so check it out. Uh, or let your colleagues know. And uh, hopefully, I'm going to see you next week. Okay, have a nice weekend. And um, again, thank you very much for, uh, for turning up for this online session. Um, you'll be coming back in, when are you coming back? coming back in March, aren't you? So if I remember right, and this is the reason why we're doing this online stuff, I've only been given about four weeks or something. It's the 25th of this month. Really? Um, okay. Um, I have to check with Carl. Um, when I was looking, last time I was looking at the, uh, the, the, the timetable, I think I only got about four weeks or something to take you for. So I'm not sure whether you use this time slot for something else. Uh, but it was a bit tight to cover all this stuff and get you ready for the exams. Yeah. So the exam is going to be, um, to, if it's four weeks, I'm not sure whether it's four weeks tuition time or four weeks in total, I've got you for. Uh, normally I leave about um, uh, two weeks for the exam, so it's one week to do the exam, and then another week in case you need to do a reset or you can't do the exam, you can't turn up or what, whatever. So to give you a chance to to catch catch up or what, to do it again if you have to. Uh, it's um it's a paper exam, paper based exam, and uh, I mean the beauty is you, you don't have to sit down for ages doing an assignment, but it's all done and dusted. And uh, if you follow the the sessions, you'll be okay for the exam. I'm pretty pretty confident. Any more questions? Uh, by the way, thanks for uh, for reminding me when you come. I'm not sure whether I've got you on the, you know, starting the 25th. Let me just check on the calendar. So the 25th is going to be that week. Okay, right. I'm not sure whether I've got you the first week, but I'll, I'll check with Carl. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'll uh, close this session. Okay, all good, okay. 
Good. Anyway, guys, have a have a have a great weekend and uh, you know, great Friday as well. And I see you, I see you in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, uh, it would be great to see you again. Okay, have you back here at the PMC? Okay, bye bye.